Good evening, Shapers Nation. Welcome to another Wednesday of Engage Culture Podcast. As usual, I'm so excited. Today, we're going to take a deep dive. This one is going to need you to pay attention. And I believe a lot of you are going to learn something new, something exciting that is going to stretch your mind and take you to another level. Right. Um, on Friday, the 23rd of July, the Olympics launched in Tokyo, Japan. So that was when they had the opening uh, ceremony. And uh, South Africa, uh, the, the rainbow nation of this world, had a very interesting fashion choice in terms of what they wore at the opening ceremony. And usually uh, the purpose of Olympics is for nations to celebrate uh, their respective flags um, and colors. And one of the things I want to open by indicating to you is that South Africa has a complex history, a complex past, a, a very dark past. Um, that um, involved racial oppression, abuse, violence, lives lost, generations destroyed, families destroyed. And in South Africa, race is a very sensitive topic. And there are certain things which happen in South Africa which can trigger racial tensions and racial divisions. We've seen this with certain advertisements. If you remember last year, the Clicks advertisement pertaining to hair products, it created a racial firestorm. And uh, the purpose of the Olympics then is for nations uh, to put their differences aside and uh, whatever their differences are, whether they're political differences, religious differences, whether it is racial differences, the Olympics present an opportunity for unity behind um, each country's respective flag. Um, even the late great Nelson Mandela saw sport as an opportunity to unify South Africa. In 1995, when South Africa hosted the World Cup, Mandela saw sports as an opportunity to heal some of the wounds of the past of South Africa. So he backed the South Africa rugby team, which was predominantly rugby, um, has predominantly been viewed in South Africa as a white sport. The team was full of white players. And here comes this new president who's just been in office and he came as a black leader. He brought the entire country to support the rugby team. And um, the Olympics are another opportunity for unity. And what happened in South Africa is interesting. When we saw um, the pictures um, of the opening ceremony begin to surface online, uh, in particular this picture, um, it created uh, very different, uh, very mixed reactions, particularly to the fashion choices of the team. And also in the picture, it looked like uh, the South African Olympic team was majority white. And there were different people reacting to those two concepts. So let's get into this. Let's look at uh, both issues. So let's talk about the composition of the team. So the team, when you look in the picture, it seems like a, a white majority team. And um, one of the things we have to be careful of is understanding that qualifying for the Olympics is not about race. It's about performance in different disciplines. So if you can run fast, you can run fast. Doesn't matter if you're white, if you're black, if you can run fast, you can run fast. If you can swim fast, you can swim fast. So concerning the composition um, of the team, an argument can be based, can be put forward that it's not even about race. It's simply just about uh, performance. And we can agree with that, that if you're fast, you're fast. If you're slow, you're slow. If you're strong, if you can lift up uh, whatever amount of weights, you can lift them up. It doesn't matter what race you are. But where race could play a part, if we're going to look at this from a nuanced perspective, is in the process of spotting and developing talent. And uh, that's where uh, the socioeconomic conditions in South Africa begin to play a part. So let's look at this scenario. Let's say there's two children born on the same day, same year. One is born um, in the Cassis. Let's say one is born in Alexandra, um, a poor black township. And then just across the road, you got another, uh, another girl who's born um, in Santon, just separated by the M1, just separated by uh, just, a just by a road. You got two children, two girls born on the same day, same city, but uh, two different races in two different communities. So you got the one kid who's born in Alex and the one kid um, who's born in Saturn. So what happens is with kid number one who's born in Alex, they're going to go to a government school um, in their community, in their poor community, a poor government school where there are five sports available. And let's say at the same time, um, the, the girl, in, the white girl who's born in Santon goes to her rich school in Santon where there are 50 sports. So just based on that, 
This one only has five options to find a talent, but this one has got 50 options. Let's say, let, let's go even further. Let's just imagine that both of them have been given the same level of talent in terms of swimming, that they both got the same talent level of swimming, but this one at the school in Alex, the swimming pool has not worked since the days of Moses. In fact, the swimming pool is so destroyed, it hasn't been fixed, so there's no more swimming at her school. So here yeah, she's growing up in this school where swimming is not available. And then um, or the, the girl from Santon, who's got the same swimming talent at her school, there's swimming, there's diving, there's water polo, there's so many options within the realm of swimming. So when we look at this uh, scenario, uh, we can see that uh, socioeconomics uh, do play a significant role um, in Olympics and uh, so you'll have that girl who grows up in Alex she has got the swimming talent but um, there's no expression at her school but then you've got the white girl at Santon who grows up and goes to the school where she's taught how to swim from the time she is four years old in fact the parents were taking her for swimming lessons from the time she was six months old and she's been swimming for years so by the time she comes to the Olympics She's got 16 years of experience, 16 to 18 years of experience of swimming. And you've got the girl from Alex stuck in Alex with the same talent, watching television of somebody with the same talent, but they just had greater opportunity. And uh, so I would like to argue that um, the, the composition of the South Africa Olympics team is not about race, it's about performance. But at the same time, we also have to be nuanced and honest that there's also a social economic issue which allows for it to be that way. And even when you look at the Olympics themselves, you know, I was watching uh, the swimming on Sunday. Uh, when you look at the top 10 countries from 2016 in Rio who won the most medals, the top 10 countries which won the most medals at that Olympics were number one was the United States. Number two was Great Britain, number three was China, number four, Russia, number five, Germany, number six, Japan, number seven, uh, number seven, France, and uh, number nine, Italy, and number 10, Australia. So when we look at all these countries, when we look at all these countries, what do they have in common? The top 10 countries which win the most medals every Olympics from the time I was watching as a kid. It's the same countries which win the, the most medals. Why is that? It all comes down to wealth. It all comes down to wealth. There's not a single poor country on that list. There's not a single poor country in that top 10 list. And for me, it's, it, it's just something we need to study in engaging culture. It's something we need to think about. As in, um, already at these Olympics, you're going to watch all these things and you're going to see the same richest countries winning the most medals and the poorer countries will win one medal here, bronze here, silver here. And if the favor of God is upon us, we're going to win a gold nyana here and there. And it will be a big deal that we got one medal, but uh, we're not in the top 10 list at all. So when I was watching these Olympi Olympics, one of the issues I noticed is there is definitely an economic issue which impacts um, the performance of these athletes on uh, this team. And you look at these other stats. The United States right now has the biggest team in terms of athletes at the Olympics. They have 657 athletes at the Olympics. Japan, who are the hosts, don't even have as many athletes as the American team. Um, they have 615 athletes at the Olympics. Uh, then number three in terms of um, artists, um, athletes um, representing their team is China. They have 431 Athletes. Now let's look at some of the African countries. We'll start with South Africa. South Africa sent 184 athletes. That's not too bad. We're, we're somewhere near, but we're still not um, on the level of the elite nations, just in terms of representation. We've got 184 athletes in 19 sports. Nigeria, they have 60 athletes competing in 10 sports. Ghana have 14, 1 4, 1 4 in 5 sports. Zimbabwe have 5 athletes representing Zimbabwe in 4 sports. Zambia have 26 in 5 sports. Kenya, 85 athletes representing them in 6 sports. How are we going to compete and win and dominate if we don't even show up? Oh, we don't even have people showing up for the events. Because at the Olympics, there are 33 sports and 46 disciplines. And um, 
all in all there are 339 medal events and we don't even feature in most of them as poor African countries as developing African countries look at some of the events which are there and I want you to I want, I want us just to do an exercise tonight I want to find out how many of you have actually done these sports before there is acrobatic gymnastics there's alpine skiing there's archery there's artistic gymnastics there's athletics there's badminton there's baseball there's beach handball there's beach volleyball there's biathlon which is a sport which includes uh, shooting and there's bar uh, there is freestyle boxing there's there, there is racing, there is bobsleighing, there is canoeing, there is equestrian, there is fencing. Equestrian involves horses. How many of you in this audience have played any of these sports or know that these sports are available in your African country? How many countries do you know there's an equestrian team? A team which goes to the Olympics to ride horses. How many of you is there a fencing team? A team which does that um, discipline of sword fighting. And uh, how many of you had these sports at your school? And uh, just the way the economics, uh, the, the, the Olympics is economically structured. It is not structured in a way that poorer nations can dominate. Because a lot of these sports are not even offered at any of our schools. They're not even offered in the country at all. So uh, I'll use me as an example. I think horse riding, um, I've ridden a horse twice. And this was at a Christian camp. Twice in my life I've ridden a horse uh, kayaking in terms of canoeing in, uh, in, in white water or anything like that, um, I'll say zero. The only canoeing I can say I did was just uh, maybe at a, at, a, at a zoo lake kind of setup, you know. But in terms of all-out kayaking, we're going, this is our hobby. We get into the car as a family. We get our canoes and go down the river. That has never happened with this brother right here. So I haven't, I've been on a horse twice and I've kayaked zero times. I cannot imagine how many of my brothers and sisters all over Africa have been on horses or, or kayaking. And uh, so how are we even going to compete when we're not even exposed <laughs> to these things? You know, life, when you look at these things, life is unfair to a certain extent. How many talented people, how many talented horse riders let's say god gave me the talent of horse riding but just the fact that even in my neighborhood there are no horses there are no horses there's no way to ride horses maybe if you go to kailami but how many people have horses available or kayaking available how many talented africans how many talented africans go to the grave with talents and gifts but they were just in environments where those platforms those spaces uh, were not available to them in order for them to develop and to express those talents. I shared this tweet um, on Sunday, you know, just after watching the swimming, I shared this tweet. I said, lack of economic development impacts the ability of people to become the best versions of themselves. And I said this very power, I said this prophetically. This was a tweet to Africa. And I said, they are not better than us. I was referring to these top 10 rich nations who keep winning all the gold and we're clapping hands for them. I said they are not better than us. They just have well-resourced systems for human flourishing. A lot of these guys we're seeing, you know, in many of these fields, even these uh, billionaires on Forbes and even these ministries we watch on, on, on TBN and we watch online, they're not better than us. They are not better than us. They just have better economic systems for human flourishing even these celebs i know you guys you love a lot of you love beyonce and you're all up in the beehive and a lot of you have all these celebrities who you hero worship and adore from the united states but i want to tell you they are not better than us they are just way more resourced than us we are just in developing a uh, politically correct statement we are in developing countries the correct statement is we are in poor countries <laughs> they are in rich countries and we are in poor countries that's the only difference um, that we have right now is that they are in systems that are because poor countries make it very difficult for you to be the best version of yourself so i don't think that the lack of representation of blacks in the south african uh, team is, is 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 a matter of racism but i do think however it's a matter of lack of black empowerment 
and uh, just this whole black empowerment issue in South Africa, it impacts everything. It's not just about tenders, it's not just about farms. It also impacts um, our, our ability to be in the Olympics, our ability to be in the cricket team, our ability to be in the rugby team, our ability to compete with Lewis Hamilton. If Lewis Hamilton was born in Uganda, with the driving talent he has, there is no Formula One in Uganda, Baba. There is no Formula One racing there. He was going to be driving combis or driving a tuk-tuk very fast. Some of these taxi drivers are probably Formula One talent drivers, but they're just in a, in a poor country with no systems to, to develop that talent. And that is very sad. So now, now that we've done with the, the composition of the team, let's talk about the fashion choices that created um, the backlash online. And uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to have a nuanced conversation um, on race in SA based on this particular uh, picture and the response of people. So when this picture came out, there were some funny tweets. You know, South Africans, hey, they can always turn something serious into something very funny. So I just want to share a couple of tweets I saw online uh, when this picture came out. Uh, the first one, I'll say it is by a guy called at Uncle Deck. He said, Mr. Price just designed the Afrikaans verse of the South African national anthem that everybody mumbles. <laughs> so the South African um, national anthem has different languages in it. And then there's an Afrikaans part. Uh, so everybody starts off, you know, everybody sing all the black folk. Trevor Noah has a beautiful joke about it where he sings through the national anthem and he says at a stadium when you've got the whole of South Africa, blacks, whites, Indians, the blacks sing the parts or the Venek parts, but when it gets to the Afrikaans part, blacks just start mumbling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everyone just starts mumbling that part. So this joke is pertaining to that, that they designed the Afrikaans verse of the South African National Anthem. And then another person, uh, Dima Mwadla, at Dima Mwadla said, Mr. Price has the team looking like landowners slash farmers. Um, at Cellular Janeiro said, um, are they all from Orania? <laughs> and then the final uh, tweet I'll say is uh, from uh, at Ntokozo EFF says, this is Team Terra Blanche. <laughs> So, so you can see already there was um, a racial division around this, uh, the way the team South Africa was looking. And um, a lot of people began to just assume that this was designed because Mr. Price um, were the brand in charge of the production of this. A lot of people felt just by looking at that, that the tender, we've got this, we got this um, term we use as tender for a government contract. So people are saying this tender was probably um, taken by white people. But it's interesting that the design team for this Olympics uh, outfit was not a white team. It was actually designed by a black team. Um, there's two ladies in there, Mbali Zulu and Nompume uh, Lelom Jadu. And then there's also two guys on the team, uh, Sandile Sikakane and Sipo Lushaba. So this team that designed this look which a lot of people feel represents white South Africa uh, and doesn't represent black South Africa, um, was not designed by. And you know, and this is why I love this kind. I love it when things like this happen because it can also just show you how our um, unconscious biases work because you see that, ah, they gave the tender to a white person. But when you look at it, you see that, wow, it was actually designed by black. So now we, we're, we're in a difficult spot now as a nation, you know, now do I keep on tearing it down because it's designed by blacks or, you know, it, I love, I love these kind of things because they force us to think outside the box. They force us to be nuanced in our thinking. So uh, in the outfit, they had a zebra print theme, um, uh, khaki shorts and valley shoes, valleys. And um, what they intended to, to represent in this was the safari life of South Africa. Um, they were trying to represent the safari life, the zebra, the zebra print was also meant to uh, represent, it was meant to honor also Nelson Man the Nelson Mandela shirts. And uh, the khaki shorts and the valleys were meant to represent uh, the safari life. But it didn't land that way with everybody. With a lot of black South Africans, it landed as 
white farmers and white landowners. And um, so the question now becomes, um, how did what was intended to unify um, a nation divide a nation? Why was something that was meant to celebrate um, just the diversity of South Africa? Because I know that was their intention. They were trying to find um, an interesting way to celebrate the diversity. They wanted to represent blacks, whites, Indians, and colors, and they found safari as um, as a as an opportunity to try and bring that. So it's a very it's a very difficult thing to do as well in South Africa because we've got so many different uh, people groups. We've got blacks, we've got whites, we've got Indians, we've got coloreds, we've got and even in the blacks we've got different tribes. We've got Zulu, we've got Pedi, we've got Tswana, we've got uh, Tonga, we've got so many different people in South Africa. So it's it's a very tough task. So my take on this particular picture is it's a failure of semiotic analysis, a failure of semiotic analysis. Before you put out any form of communication for the consumption by an audience, you have to run a thorough semiotic analysis and predict and forecast how it's going to land with your target audience. Um, in the case of Team SA and the design team, they had two audiences that they had to pay attention to. They had to pay attention um, to the global audience in terms of what message they wanted to portray to the world about South Africa and what represents South Africa. At the same time, they also had to pay attention to the South African audience because if you're going to the world and saying, this is, what South this is uh, a representation of South Africa, you've also got to pay attention to uh, the audience you're representing in terms of does what we are presenting to the world really represent you? Um, so, unfortunately, um, in this particular case, I believe they failed um, in that uh, on the first front, um, they seem to be telling the world a story about South African safari. And in my honest view, if I'm putting on my brand strategy brain on here, I think the, uh, the concept of uh, Africa, South Africa, uh, the safari concept, I think it's a bit played out and overplayed. Yeah, the, the Lion King, Jungle, Tarzan ideology of Africa, which for me personally put me off uh, coming to America too. I think just this, this trope and stereotype of Africa is a jungle and there's animals and just come to Africa to see animals. I think that whole concept um, is played out, you know, I, we're like the only country in every country as animals But we seem like to be the one country where we are obsessed about our wildlife um, we, we are really obsessed with our animals our big five and um, I think part of our brand strategy also has to shift that there's more to Africa than just uh, Mufasa, Simba, Rafiki There's more to us than that, you know, and um, I think it just feeds into this stereotype which me personally, I'm not a fan of. You can be a fan of it. But for me, I don't see lions every day. I have to go to the lion park or I have to go to the safari or to the zoo to see these animals, you know. So they, they are not a part of our day-to-day -day life. They're animals in the bush. That's all they are. And that's not, that's not the greatest part, uh, in my opinion, of the, the African story. There's more to us than just animals and bushes. And then in terms of the essay audience, I think they failed uh, because they wanted to promote safari lifestyle um, and um, the safari as well. The majority of South Africans don't go to South Af don't go to safaris, you know, so the valleys in particular were representing the safari. The majority of black South Africans don't go to safaris. And also, um, in terms of the audience interpreting, in terms of f the farms and all of that, majority of blacks don't own farms, are not farm owners. So already they had put themselves into a niche. Once they took that creative choice, they were putting themselves in a niche. So they took a minority group, people who go to safaris and white farmers, and um, they put that on a global stage, but it doesn't represent the majority of South Africa. And I believe that this was a semiotics analysis failure. And let me break it down to you what semiotics is. Semiotics 
is the study of signs and symbols and in particular their use or interpretation semiotics is the study of signs and symbols in particular their use and their interpretation so a sign is defined as anything that communicates meaning that is not the sign itself to the signs interpreter so there are two things when it comes to signs and semiotics uh, there is the sign itself and the meaning that this, the use of the sound intends uh, the interpreter of the sign to have so you've got two you got two components you got someone sending a message and someone receiving the message and in between them there is a sign now the difficulty becomes when the person communicating a message for example the the sign uh, i am using the sign they used was the zebra print and the valleys so the design team were communicating um safari the beauty of safari and uh, the gorgeous animals we have in africa and in south africa and that was to them that was what they were communicating but to the audience in south africa it split us in two there are those who interpreted you know the people who love safaris and people who love animals and people who are like oh i love safari i can't wait when the lockdown is over i want to go for another safari um or for someone with a farm wow they wearing my shoes i can't wear. oh awesome my shoes are at the olympics but then for the majority of south africans it's like ah what is this now <laughs> what is this so the the sign itself you may use it with one intention but it's interpreted another way so that is where semiotics is concerned it's concerned about the signs and when you're looking at signs the first thing you have to understand are what are known as the signifier and what is signified the signifier and what is signified so in semiotics um the first concept is signifier signifiers are the physical forms of science they can be words sounds or images words sounds or images so let's use a gun as an example the word gun is when you see the word written the 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 string of letters w o r d they are a sign signifying what gun is and then when you look at the sound for example the sound of the sound of a gunshot signifies that a gun has been shot and then the image of a gun signifies a gun so then the next concept when it comes to sign is what is signified and what does and and what is the signify what is signified by the signifier so let's go back to this gun example so when you read the word gun or when you hear a gunshot or when you see an image of a gun um what is signified when you read the word gun in other words what meaning do you attach to a gun so uh for someone else when they see a gun or hear a gun it could mean hunting when they see a gun the first thing that comes to their mind is hunting for some when they see a gun the first thing that comes to their mind could be crime for someone else in the same audience when they see a gun the first thing that comes to their mind is law enforcement for some people like americans when they see a gun for some they see it as their constitutional right to arm themselves for self defense so the image of a gun is a signifier but even though that image is a signifier there's something that it signifies and um semiotic analysis tries to interpret okay we've got this signifier a gun what does it signify what message does this send to our audience and um to go deeper into semiotics there's two other things we have to look at two other concepts which are denotation and connotation denotation is the most basic literal meaning of a sign e.g when you see a gun the denotation is it's just literally gun it's just a gun it's just a gun that's all it is but connotation then looks at the cultural meanings of a sign the feelings the secondary feelings and uh, ideas 
that are invoked by the image of a gun. So, uh, so let's apply this to this particular uh, design choice by the Team SA uh, design team. So when they denoted zebra print and valleys, the literal meaning was here is a zebra print shirt and a valley shoes. But the problem comes not with the denotation. The problem comes um, with the connotation of the denotation. The connotation of the denotation. That's where it gets murky now. Because with the connotation side, so we've designed this outfit. Now, this is our denotation. What it literally is. But there's a connotation. There's some connotations connected to these signs. So they had the responsibility to look at what are the cultural meanings and ideas and feelings amongst the majority of South Africans about zebra print and valleys, the valley shoes. What, are the, what feelings do people see, think of when they see someone walking into, for example, when you're at a supermarket at a Woolies, when you see someone walk in that supermarket wearing uh, khaki shorts and valleys, the first thing that comes to your mind, what is it? It's not safari. It's not safari. It's farmer. You automatically don't think, oh, this person must be a farmer. I remember when, um, was it Casper your vest? He had a music video where he was on a farm and he was wearing the valleys and the khakis. So... And the first thing that came to our mind was he's, he's talking about agriculture and taking back uh, the land. That's what that's, the song was signifying black empowerment and he was touching on the issue of the need uh, for black farmers. So the negative feedback that they are getting for this design choice is telling us that this is a misfire of semiotics because they didn't take time to study the cultural meaning and ideas and feelings that um and i'll zero in on valleys that the valleys would invoke uh from the south african majority because the south african the black south african majority would view it as this is representing um the the land owners and the land farmers and this sign actually excludes us so they were so the pe so the the people consuming this they were hit on two fronts the composition of the team seemed majority white and then to put salt in the wounds the way they were dressed <laughs> they weren't dressed in a way that they could relate to so to fix that problem um if i was the brand manager and the brand strategist behind this once they brought these things to me i would have easily have said you know uh we can't go with the village look if we're going to tweak this if you don't want to change everything let's just tweak this thing just on the on the footway if they are going to wear, for example, Batu sneakers um, at the Olympics and they've got uh, a fusion of safari, farming and Batu, you're going to bring two worlds together. You're going to bring the world of safari and then the world of the urban, Kasi uh, lifestyle of South Africa. And you're also going to put a black South African brand on a global stage. I'm telling you, if that picture, if we just adjusted one thing, one thing. If they just put Batu sneakers on that picture, this conversation would be dead. It wouldn't even be happening. It would have been like, wow, Batu to the world. You know, we've taken our, our African brand to the world. This was a missed opportunity. And um, going forward, South African brands have to pay attention to the semiotics that relate to the cultural context of South Africa. Pay attention to when you put something out there what is being signified what are the connotations what are the feelings what are the the cultural feelings and ideas um, around this every graphic designer every uh, communications director every person in marketing or advertising any person in the field of communications you definitely need some training on semiotic analysis and then you've got to study when we are putting something out there how is it going to land with the cultural sensibilities of the audience? And I'm going to close with two scriptures. Luke 12, 54. It says, Then Jesus turned to the crowd and said, 
When you see clouds beginning to form in the west, you say, here comes a shower, and you are right. When the south wind blows, you say, today will be a scorcher, and it is. Then he says, you fools, you know how to interpret the weather signs, the semiotics of weather. But you don't know how to interpret the present times. We must learn how to read the room. We must learn how to read the room. Uh, we must learn how to read people. We must learn how to read a culture. Learn how to read the times. And also learn how to read a nation. And when we put something out for public consumption, we must know that what are the semiotics behind this? What are the connotations behind what we're putting out there? Matthew 21, 19 says, we see, and, and he says, and seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves alone. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And uh, this one I just want to close just as, a, as an extra bonus. It's a different thought, you know. Um, on social media, we've got a lot of people who have signs which they put out of connotations of wealth and success. People who are extremely flashy. But a lot of them are like these fig trees. Fig trees with leaves but no fruit. There's a lot of looking rich, but you don't see uh, a system or a structure that generates uh, the revenue to justify that level of expenditure and that level of boasting. We have to make sure that we shift our minds from being people who are just, who are moved by signs of consumption and not signs of production, signs of liabilities and not signs of assets. We need to shift our thinking, ladies and gentlemen, to be people who understand semiotics and can do a semiotic analysis of a music video, of a movie. What is being signified here? Especially in the music industry, there's a lot of stuff happening right now. There's a lot of satanic and demonic uh, signs that we're seeing in music. We've seen it for years, but it seems to be ramping up. What is being signified here you know there's a there's hyper hyper sexualization um it's always been there particularly in the hip-hop industry but over the past five to ten years it's gone on steroids it's gone crazy and we have to pay attention to the science what is what is the culture saying what is the culture saying to all of us you know why are we being told that to be rich you gotta have a louis vuitton bag you gotta have gucci but no one is telling us how to build companies how to uh, stack up investments, how to stack up assets. It's all about expanding our concept of wealth as Africans and as blacks. It's all about spending, spending, showing off, spending. We don't get people who are building things of value. And I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight as we close. Um, learn how to read the room. Learn how to communicate. Learn how to read people. Learn how to read the times. Learn how to, when you go on social media, when you're watching a movie, you got to be able to also understand what are the semiotics when you see an advert. What are the, what are the semiotics? What, what trope? What stereotype? What, what are they trying to say here? That's how we become wiser and that's how we become greater. And I want to close by wishing every African team nothing but success. I wish Team South Africa nothing but success. Bring more medals home. Despite that fashion, I'm going to support every one of our athletes, black, white, Indian, whatever, green. I'm going to support them all and wish them well. I'm going to support Team Zimbabwe. I'm going to support Team Nigeria. I hope they do well in basketball. I'm going to support, definitely support in Kenya for all those um, runs that they're going to be doing. I'm going to support every African team. And just show love and just uh, and, and pray that we bring more gold medals. And also I'm praying that um, our countries uh, develop economically so that we don't have uh, graveyards that are full of people who are extremely talented. But they just weren't in systems of uh, well-resourced systems for human flourishing. So I pray that God bless you and that the Lord keep you. And let's engage next week. God bless you.